This is Matt. Just a quick heads up before we start this week's show. There is one beeped curse word. Sorry about that. Hope it's okay. Uh, also, we had a few technology issues and a few audio issues this week. Hopefully it doesn't sound any different than normal. But if it does, know that we struggled with that stuff this week, but we'll make sure it doesn't happen next week. All right? Here's the show. Подача Остин! Все-таки забил! Он тебе не ступи, Hello and welcome to another episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans. My name is Matt Markson. I'm the host of the show. And no matter where you are, no matter how you may be listening, whether this is your first time or you've been with us before, thank you for making the show part of your day. I hope that you enjoy it. This week, we have two matches to talk about. Coming off of that impressive victory over Everton uh, on Sunday, uh, we go into a midweek fixture with Manchester City. Don't really think anybody was expecting us to get anything major from that. Um... The fact that we were in it so long and to have it ripped away in the manner that it was with that last second strike from Raheem Sterling, uh, I think that hurt. It hurt me. Uh, It was gutting to watch. And that had the potential to kind of stifle uh, us moving forward going into that match with with Bournemouth. And uh, and then going into that match, I think a lot of us would have been expecting to win that match and was disappointing to only draw. But... um, all in all, probably a fair result. But uh, to help me kind of make sense of that all and talk about everything from the two matches and our performances and Fraser Forrester and uh, Pep Guardiola and all that stuff uh, is Aiden Osman. You can find him on Twitter at Aiden underscore Osman 96. Aiden writes for Reed Southampton and he's been on the show before, uh, but this is the first time he's joined me to talk about uh, specific matches. So I hope that you uh, enjoy his perspective. We'll get to that interview uh, in just a second, but before we do that, I just want to point you in the direction of the We Are Southampton page on Instagram. For match day edits, polls, competitions, and more, be sure to check out the We Are Southampton page on Instagram. Matt, who runs the page, has been a huge help. He's been a guest on this show multiple times, and he's been a huge help to me in getting this thing going. So head on over to the We Are Southampton page on Instagram, give it a follow. You will not regret it. So let's go ahead and move into my conversation now with Aiden Osman. We'd like to welcome back to the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all the SFC fans, Aiden Osman. You can find him on Twitter at Aiden underscore Osman 96. He writes for Reed Southampton and he's here to talk about the Manchester City match, the Bournemouth match, uh, and everything else going on with Saints FC. Try to help make sense of it. Aiden, welcome back to the show and thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, no worries. Good to be back. Yeah, it's been, it's been a while since we've talked, but, uh, you know, lots gone on and a little bit more positive over the past. A uh, couple of performances, maybe today uh, changes that up uh, after looking at the Bournemouth match, that draw, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about it and we'll get your thoughts on it. Just kind of before we do that, what, what's new with you? Anything anything different from the last time we spoke? Um, not really, no. Just the same old student life, writing, learning, all this sort of stuff, getting on with it. Yeah. You know, the mental breakdowns over this wonderful club of ours, you know. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um I think long gone are the days when just watching the club was kind of relaxing, you know, like it, it, now it's, it's kind of a little bit tense for me at times, but it's okay. I don't, I don't think the games have ever been that relaxing, but I think those games, like when you look back at what we thought wasn't relaxing of the previous managers and we look back at it now and you think, wow, well, I'll take that in a heartbeat. So, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you live up in the Manchester area. You live up in Manchester. So you were able to go to the Manchester City match, actually. So you had a, a much different perspective than I did. Uh, I was at work because it was a noon kickoff, I think, for, for me or somewhere around there. And so uh, difficult to, to be able to watch the match. I did squeeze in portions of it. So, so we'll talk about that uh, first, I guess. Um, when, the, when the lineup came out, I mean, you saw we were going uh, either 3-5-2 or 5-3-2, depending on how you look at it. Um, what were your thoughts on, on us changing up the formation and the, and the manager's willingness to do that going into a city team that, you know, uh, is already sitting on, I think, 40 points at, at this point? See, this is where it's difficult. I can understand why he did it, but, like, I think out of the starting 11, I'd have probably had two different players to, and left the other nine the way they were for that game that we had available. So I was a little bit frustrated to see them two up top. 
um, frustrated when I saw it because when you looked at it on paper, we'd only scored one goal from that lineup all season. So lots of frustration. I think sat there looking at it tactically, we we knew as soon as we conceded, we'd pretty much be f***ed. <laughs> but um, then Buffal came on, you know, brought a bit of fight, a bit of attacking flair, and there uh, was Lod involved with our goal. So hey ho. Like you said, looking at the lineup, uh, we had scored four goals the previous match against Everton, and none of those players, none of the players who scored were in that lineup uh, at City. So we looked like we were uh, essentially parking the bus. But I I think you can understand that, though, given that we went out at Liverpool not that long ago, tried to have a go a little bit, and and we obviously saw how that worked out. So I think uh tactically it, it might have been the right decision but it was a very defensive kind of setup and and like i said i can understand it but uh when you when you said you know as soon as we 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 score uh, they scored we were going to be in trouble and i think that was I think that was true um but overall uh looking at that performance what did you make of it did you did you see anything differently uh, that saints had that saints were doing versus previous uh matches um not really too close to be fair. I think we we defended well. I think the first time all season I can turn around we defended well or reasonably well. Um I don't know, we created chances but then again they were only bit parts, you know, set pieces, corners. Well, I think all three by the goal were corners. So I think that's how we knew we were gonna play. Um I don't know. I just I hate to see us that defensive. I'd rather see us go out and have a have a go at a game, even if it is Man City. Or whoever else. I mean, you can say we tried to do it at Anfield, but we didn't really didn't even have a shot on target against like a really poor back four. So I, d- I don't know. Like it was good in the sense that we could defend and defend well, and we stopped City from their normal game. But then we pretty much offered nothing going forward on the ball. It all had to come through with set plays. Right. And, and like you said, we did have a few chances and, and they all seem to fall to defenders. I think, uh, Hoyt missed the header. Uh, Yoshida had an attempt. I think Hoyt actually hit the, the woodwork, but it was, it was gonna, we were gonna rely on those, on those set pieces to have any kind of chance to score. Um, and you would have hoped that we could have done something with it, but, um, it just didn't quite come off. And then, um, of course, Romeo gets the goal. Uh, we, we even it up. And from that point on, um, well, actually, let's talk about this. When we went behind, what were you thinking that we had any chance to, to get back into it? Or do you, did you think it was going to end one nothing, Or did you think it was going to end, you know, 3 or 4 nothing? I thought, oh, here we go, the fourth game, so I don't, to be honest. <laughs> Give, given our defence and our reform and their attacking ability, the way they play football, and the players they've got, I thought the fourth gates had opened and we were going to concede in the 3 or 4. Even though we, I thought we defended really, really well during that match, I thought there were a few instances where we made mistakes. And, and one, giving away that free kick that led to City's first goal, I thought was a mistake on our part. free kick was disgusting as well. Like, it was actually horrendous. And the fact that Fraser Forster doesn't cover his near post as well, again, doesn't even surprise me. But we need to defend better from set pieces and we need a goalkeeper that's actually going to um, command his area. Yeah, I was... I, I didn't know what to make of it. I was, I was pretty devastated when I saw that it, when I saw the score and then I saw how it happened and to kind of the, everything leading up to it. Um, kind of thought like, you know, you, you've put in, you know, 45 minutes of, of pretty good defensive work, a really good defensive work. And then to give away that free kick to, to, to kind of let off for just a second, that's all city need. And like you said, I was a little concerned that it, that, that might have the start of a lot more for them. Um, but it, it, it turns out not, not to be. Um, Later on in that half, Van Dijk had a, had a chance to score. He couldn't keep his header down. And then Romeo finally scores and levels it up. Um, but le- let's talk real quick. You, you mentioned Buffal coming into the side um, midway through the game, really kind of helping create that chance for Romeo. Uh, how important is Buffal right now to kind of our team going forward? Um, very, very. He's probably our best uh, forward-thinking player. I mean, the ability can to meet a man, beat a man, and then... You know, all three of the goals he scored have been absolutely phenomenal. Um, his assist for the Romeo goal was exceptional. And I think we know he's got it in his locker. On, uh, I believe it was the Totally Football Show, they were talking about how he needs to be given just a free kind of role. Um, almost like 
uh, a Mesut Ozil type role in the middle of the park where he shouldn't necessarily be required to do uh, or put in the defensive work. He should just be able to kind of roam free and go as he pleases. Um, how, how do you feel about, about giving him that, that sort of role? Do you think that is a, maybe a, a necessary part of, of his game or, or do you think that we're not a side that can accommodate that right now? I think he'd be better off out on the left if he knows. He was more of an actual winger. I mean, he, he, he's, uh, like, the other thing you can see is defensive qualities. I mean, he's largely involved with the original goal. He won the ball back in our own half, set Bertrand away, and then set it into Tonic. And, uh, he, well, I think he'd just get crowded out to him and play just behind as a number 10. So I think out, out wide where he can have, like, a free one-on-one roam with a defender is a lot better than keep him in the cr- middle of the park. He seems to have developed that, and I think we've talked about it. Uh, he seems to have developed his defensive a little bit more this year. He seems to be more willing to track back, more willing to ride a challenge, and to actually put and to put one in himself. We saw that today. Um, so I, I think that he has maybe adjusted his game a little bit. Um, and as long as you can give him the freedom to kind of get forward and, and encourage him to do so, uh, which I don't really think he he needs that much encouragement. He seems to be able to do that just fine on his own. Um, I think he's, like you said, he's been good out wide um, and allow him to come in the middle and, and drive in if he wants. And, and, you know, I think he's, I think that is a good role for him. I was just wondering kind of uh, what your thoughts were on this idea that he should be just kind of set free and not required to do uh, the defensive work, which I, I don't necessarily agree with at all. Um, just, just wanted to get a perspective on that. Um, going into the, the final minutes of, of, of the city match when they put up the five minutes of stoppage time. And I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but when they put up the five minutes of stoppage time, what, what were, what were the thoughts in the Southampton uh, away in how, how shocked were you or were you surprised at all? Very surprised. <laughs> I think we all said, where did they get five minutes? It was, it was weird. I don't remember there being that much stoppage time in the second half, to be honest. And where the ref got five from generally did surprise the living daylight out of me. I think, you know, when I looked at, uh, somebody did the math and they were, they did the substitutions, the goals and all this stuff. And it should have been something like three and a half. Um, and you wonder if we were almost being punished for, uh, the time wasting that we were accused of doing when it was still nil nil in the first half, or even after we tied it up and it was one, one, um, you wonder if that comes into, into play there at all. And I'm, and I'm not sure if it does, but, um, five minutes did seem like a lot. And then to have, to have Sterling be able to, uh, put that chance away the way he did uh, so late in the game, really with the last kick of the game, it, it, that was, that was absolutely gutting. And um, I don't know for you going into the city match, how much were you expecting versus how much did that hurt um, to have Sterling kind of rip away a point from us right at the end? I wasn't expecting a lot going into the game. I'm not going to lie. I thought we were going to get beaten. Um, but coming out, it really did hurt seeing that. Like I was, and frustrated and angry and oh, I don't like it. Didn't deserve like because City didn't create that much, and it just took a moment like that in like the dying seconds just to kill us off. Like just let us have something good in our lives. We look at the football we've had to see all season, please. <laughs> yeah, and it, it it's one of those instances where it's almost it almost doesn't quite make sense because had we gotten beaten four or five nil it probably wouldn't have hurt as bad because that's kind of what we expected. But because the team came out and played the way they did, they played with, you know, so much passion and so much heart and, and kind of, so, they played so hard and they made it so difficult for city that to all of a sudden have it kind of be torn away by, by one guy that late in the match, it was terrible. You know, it felt terrible. Um, so I think I, and I, I can only imagine what it felt like there in the stadium for, for those of you who had, who had traveled to, to see it. Yeah. Quite, quite a lot of us forgot it. I think sat with Luke and Luke, Luke was, um, Luke was very emotional at the end. I mean, he looked like he wanted to cry, bless him. So it was just, it was emotional for everyone. I think to defend and play that well and keep him quiet for so long. Yeah. Um, late on in the match, Cedric went off injured. Uh, I think it was the 87th. Um, didn't know how serious it was at the time. Um, but up until that point, like we, we mentioned earlier, we were playing kind of five at the back, uh, cause we were defending so deep. Um, and he had done a really, really good job. And at that point we switched to a back four. Um, McQueen went over to the left-hand side to play ahead of Bertrand and we went to either playing like a four, five, one or a four, four, one. Basically everybody was defending, but it was two banks of four instead of, um, a bank of five. 
how, and we'll get, we'll get to this a little bit more as well, moving into the Bournemouth match, but how important is Cedric to us versus how, you know, do you think that us having to move to a back four that late to have to change up uh, the kind of ideas uh, defensively, do you think that led to Sterling being able to find just that little bit of space that he hadn't been able to find the, the rest of the match? Possibly. I think Cedric, Cedric's arguably one of our best players. The role he does, I mean, he not only, he's not only a solid defender, but he also gets forward and supports the attack. Um, you know, his delivery from crosses is exceptional. Um, his work rate, I mean, the intensity he puts in, I mean, his all-round physical fitness and gains, absolutely amazing. So I think, yeah, when when you've not got a player like that marking you and you've got my either playing up, you know, things become a little bit easier. I just, I mean... When he went off, my immediate thought was, how are we going to do this? Are we still going to continue to play five? And when I saw McQueen go over kind of to play in front of Bertrand, it was like, you know, I immediately worry a little bit and I didn't want to. I wanted to kind of keep a positive frame of mind, but it, it just didn't didn't pay off. I mean, less than 10 minutes of that and not a goal, all three points. So it's kind of the way it works. Um, but coming out of that, um, coming out of that match, what were maybe some of the positive points that you can can look to and say like, you know, we can be proud of, of, of X, uh, of, of what the team did that day. I think a lot of the defending was there to, you know, stand up and be sort of, yes, we can hold them. We can, you know, defensively, we can, you know, stop these teams dead in their track. I think that was a huge positive to take out. I think the fact that, um, I think the pos- the positivity that Buffal brought on when he came on was, uh, something very positive to think about. I think the way he plays, is key for us going forward. And I think, I don't know. Well, I do. It's hard, it's hard to put into words, but I think he could arguably be our key man of the season going forward, along with the likes of Mario Lamina and Van Dijk. So. Well, I mean, that gives you a, you know, kind of a, a, a defender, a, a, a true kind of midfielder, and then a guy who can attack that kind of build through. So that's, you know, ideally what we want, but we need them all to kind of be kicking or clicking on all cylinders, I guess, for that to, to really work out. Um, one other, uh, one other big talking point is, you know, Forrester made a lot of saves during this match. Um, looking at them, some of them you, you argue maybe, uh, he could have caught instead of just parrying them away. Um, but do you think he's getting any, any better, uh, versus kind of his poor performances over, over parts of last season and much of this season? Um, I think that was arguably his best performance since Ronald Koeman left the club, to be fair. I mean, he was largely at fault for the first goal, but he stood up and was counted for. I think he stepped up to the plate when he was needed to. I mean, he had an excellent save from Gabriel Jesus. Um, yeah, he could he could have caught the shots. I think that was quite a bit of a worry. Quite a few of them. I mean, I think he was partly. At, I mean, I know Wesley Hoot was majority at fault today, but I think he could have done a lot better with that goal that uh, Bournemouth scored. I think I think I look at a lot of the times we concede. And nine times out of ten, I think he should be doing better there. And that's the standard that he's set for himself. And he's just not delivering. And it's just not good enough, to be honest. Um, do you think that he's being challenged at all for his position in the first team by anybody else that's at the club? No. Clearly not. Otherwise, he wouldn't, just walk, he wouldn't walk into the team every every match day. I mean, McCarthy must actually be terrible because <laughs> forced it crap. Because, like... That that's bad, but he's got to be worse than not to get in. I mean, especially with the mistakes that Force has made this season, and well, over the last sixteen to eighteen months, anyway. Yeah. Um. One other big thing that that came out of that match it happened afterwards. Um. And I'm not sure you being in the stadium if you would have seen it, but I'm sure you've seen it replayed afterwards. Nathan Redman was approached by Pep Guardiola on the field, and there were it looked like some intense words from Pep flying towards Nathan, uh, or towards Redmond. I shouldn't, we're not best friends. I shouldn't use his first name, but like, um, during that, you know, Redmond covers his mouth every time he speaks to him, uh, and it's back and forth and back and forth. And then Pep turns to his own guy and kind of gives him a slap on the back and, and, uh, whatever it is. But what, what did you make of, of, of that? And some of the things, some of the stories that have happened afterwards, uh, Redmond's come out and said that uh, Pep was nothing but complimentary and he wanted him to attack and things like this. But what would you what would you make of of that situation? Do you think Pep's out of line at all? I don't think Pep's done anything wrong. Wrong to be honest. I think he's just sort of you know he's he's a very passionate guy. He's like that with all his players. He's seen videos of his time at Bayern, you know, Barca, and now at City. You know, saying 
this is how you should play. And he just, it's, it's frustrating for him to see a player of Redmond's quality, you know, so defensively and not given the freedom to express himself. And I think that's just what he was saying to Redmond, to be honest. Uh, you know, the, the way he did it was like very passively, but kind of aggressively. But I mean, I can't really blame him. Emotions were quite high after the game. Yeah, I mean, real time, that's probably less than three minutes from when Sterling scored, you know? Yeah. And so y- you can understand it. And I can also understand, um, I don't know if you watched Pellegrino's press conference, but he said he hadn't seen it and he hadn't really talked to, to Redmond about it. And that for me was a little bit concerning. Like, you know, how did you, how did you miss that? Do you live in a cave or are you live in a hole? Like, what is your deal? But I don't necessarily think Pep did anything wrong. Uh, it looks bad in, in the 30 second clip that you see online. Um, but the fact that, that Redmond has come out and said what he said about it, um, I think is, is, uh, is fine. Um, one thing that I did kind of have an issue with is, is what, when Pep said that he, you know, that he didn't like basically the fact that we, we put so many men behind the ball and made it difficult for him. Um, you know, we're coming in to try to win a game or to try to take a point, whatever it is. Um, I, I'm not sure what he expects people to do, uh, when they face a team that, that he has, I mean, people are going to, people are going to do that. I think very few teams are going to come in and try to have a go at, at, at Manchester city simply because I don't think very many people can go toe to toe with them. It's frustrating because you can see football can be played with men behind the ball. It could be played, you know, it could be played with teams passing and, you know, the nice little interchanges and stuff like that. And I think, you know, he's got, well, it's his opinion at the end of the day. I mean, he, you know, you can't, you can't change his opinion. Right. And I'm, Firm believer that football should be played his way, well, or in a similar style to his way, where you have the freedom to express yourself, but you're also solid defensively. But I don't know. I think it was clear the intentions from the line of the opinion that we were going to sit behind the ball, and that's not really a way I expect us to play. It's not the Southampton or the labelled Southampton way that we're all so used to, which is free flow and attacking football. So uh, yeah, I can understand his frustrations. I can understand why he said that but then again at the end of the day it's not his team to you know to manage his it, it was his team to play against right right he's got to figure out a way to beat us you know yeah with it to be fair so you know yeah um coming out coming out of that game um i was pretty proud of the way the team i thought fought um i thought that the, the dramatic turnaround from liverpool uh t- two weekends before to the Everton and city matches, I thought that look, we look completely different. Um, not to say that we were attacking, uh, in, in any kind of way that very freely in the Manchester city game. Cause I thought that our performances, uh, or our game plan against Everton and, and city were very different, but the idea that we kind of stuck together as a unit and really fought and, and challenged for balls and, and challenged for second balls and things like that. I was very happy with that. Um, would you say that, or would you agree with that? Or would you think that we were, um, do you, you think we can hold our heads up high after that after that city loss? I think they were two good performances from the side, to be honest. I think they were probably arguably one of the two better performances of the season. Um, we've not really had a much to chat about, and I think the way we... Well, the performance in the fight and the character code against City was a lot, and just the performance against Everton in general that it was against a very, 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 very poor and out-of-form Everton side. So, swings and roundabouts, really. Um... I guess moving into today, I think coming off of that Everton and the city performances, I think we would have expected uh, maybe something a little different. I've been told, you know, in my time as a Southampton fan, I've been told this over and over and over that there's only one Derby and that is, that's Portsmouth. Is this a Derby against Bournemouth for, for us? This, this in no way is a Derby whatsoever. It's a rivalry. It's not a Derby. I think consider Liverpool more of a Derby than I think I'd look at the when the fixtures are announced. I'm not asked about when because you know I could expect six points from them, but I look forward to more sort of the games against the bigger clubs or arguably Portsmouth when we played them. Is this just a narrative drummed up by the TV companies, by the media, just to to give it a reason to put it on TV and get people to watch? I think so, pretty much. And obviously the Bournemouth fans think it's a rivalry, but we're not really asked about them to be honest. It, for you, is this any different than playing uh, Brighton or anything, or is it? I wouldn't even consider Brighton a rivalry, to be honest. I think the only reason Brighton we have any sort of history is because of the League One, and um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of when the fixtures get drawn, I wouldn't look out for when we're playing Bournemouth and Brighton. I did more sort of look out for 
games against the bigger teams or when we're going to go away to places like Anfield, Old Trafford, the Etihad, the Emirates, Stamford Bridge, Wembley, well, Wembley. Yeah. You know, All right. I, I'm not really bothered about them. Like, I want us to win every game, but I won't go in, the, I won't go in this game any more excited than I would go into a derby or Portsmouth because I'd be a lot more up the mark. Judging from the way that I think most Southampton, because I think a lot of people agree with you that it's not a derby. Um, and, you know, I'm taking my cue from the fans who have been there for a long time, and I'm, I'm not calling it that. And, um, you know, Pellegrino did call it that in his press conference. But uh, the idea that it's not a derby for us, but maybe it is for them and their fans, do you think that makes it a little bit more difficult for us? Do you think maybe they're a little bit more up for it than we are? Or do you think the players just kind of go, this is another game, and that's it. Possibly. I mean, I think I think their players would probably be a lot more up for it than what our players would be. You look at you look at them and you just think oh, it's Bournemouth in it. It's not it's not anything to be excited about. I mean, yeah, okay, they play some decent football every now and again, but they're always sort of there or thereabouts where they're going to be. It's one of those where you look at it and you think Bournemouth, we could pick up some points here rather than Bournemouth. It's a big game. Um. Looking at the formation today, we, we talked a little bit about um, Cedric being out. Uh, and, you know, at the time we didn't realize how serious it was, but it was announced earlier this week that he wasn't going to be able to, to play. Um, and there was some, some comments online and some discussion that, you know, who, who's going to replace him, whether it be uh, PA, whether it be Yoshida, whether Stevens comes in and does it. I saw some people arguing that maybe Ward Prowse could do it in a back, in a back three. Um, although I don't necessarily agree with that, but um, was there any doubt in your mind that that PA was going to be the guy to come in and and, and play that right back position? Plus, I mean, he was out for a long time with a long, and um, fair play to Pellegrino for throwing him in and saying he's confidence in him. Um, I don't know, he's a, he's he's the most you know he's the best fit for the replacement, and I thought he did well today. To be honest, I think he peeled away well. He played well. He he got forward when he could. He tackled well. Um, you know, he didn't have a lot of cover with James Ward Prowse out on the right. It caught a little bit in the first half. It got better when Redmond came on. Mm-hmm. Had a bit more cover because he had a natural winger in front of him rather than, you know, someone who's only there to take three kicks. So that, that's, uh, I don't know. I think he did well. You know, I think obviously we're going to miss Cedric, but I think we've got, um, more than an adequate replacement for if he's injured for a certain amount of games. See, I think that my expectations for PA are, are, it's difficult to make them because he hasn't really played very much. Uh, he got injured early on last year, didn't make a whole lot of, uh, of appearances after that. Uh, I know he's been playing for the under 23s, but I'll be honest, I don't really get a chance to watch them as, as, as often as I would like. Um, uh, he was a midfielder. And so in my mind, at least, I think he would be better as a wing back. Um, but I think there were a few chances today created where, Bournemouth really passed around him and he got caught ball watching and then trying to catch up. Um, there were a couple of times where, where the winger was able to get in behind him, which I wasn't really happy with, but, but truthfully, I think if I really kind of take a step back from it and not just react to what happened today, it's that my expectations for that position on the pitch are so high because of how good Cedric is. I think everyone needs to remember that this is either his first or second game of the season and when you're not in and around the team, it's the team's responsibility to give him help as well. I think you can't just solely rely on him. I think the team need to, needed to help him. I think Ward Price needed to be better defensively um, because he just seems to go missing a lot, to be honest. I think he had his best game ever against Everton, but other than that, he doesn't really seem to do much other than delivery, which is arguably why he's on God knows, but... You know, yeah, I think yeah. it's stupid to have a player on 30, 40 grand a week who was, you know, is only good for set pieces. And it's hard when you haven't got that sort of cover in front of you. You realize you might take some hate for that, <laughs> right? I don't. Uh, I'll, honestly, I'll take a lot more hate for the next comment if I, if we want to get onto a ward cross. Uh oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to, to, to criticism because it, cause it seems like he's been uh, a lot of promise up until now. And it's always been, he's, he is kind of the next thing coming. And uh, you kind of wonder when, when does he get there? When does he really establish himself and where does he fit on the, on, in the squad and all that? But I, I did think that that side of the pitch, the right side of the pitch looked a little bit too slow in the first half. Um, yeah. and, and it, like you said, it did look a lot better with Redmond coming on in front of him. Um, and in the past, I've always kind of thought that Bertrand and, 
and Redmond was a decent combination, but Bertrand looks like he can get forward more. Um, and I heard this, this said uh, elsewhere that Bertrand looks like he can get forward more with somebody other than Redmond out in front of him. And so I thought Redmond going over and playing on the right side in front of PA forward Prowse was, was a, was a good move. Um, and, and overall I thought we looked a lot better, uh, going into the second half for, for large periods of, of, of that half. Yeah, I'd, I'd say you're right there, to be honest. I think Bertrand looks better going forward without Redmond in front of him because Redmond's sort of, he's more sort of a one trick pony when he's on that side. He'll, um, he'll do a couple of step overs and then try and cut inside, whereas on the right hand side, he's kind of like, you know, he can, he can go down the byline or he can have PA or Cedric overlap uh-huh. that way. I think it's harder for him to cut in onto his left foot rather than it is for him on his right foot. So it's better just leaving him out there than it is, you know, having him cut inside and try and shoot from 30 odd yards and, you know, sky it and Bertrand's made a brilliant overlap where he could feed Austin or Gabby Dini or whoever else. Coming into, into the match and, and, and going forward, I thought the first five to 10 minutes were, were a little bit sloppy, um, kind of ball bouncing around everywhere. It didn't really look that settled, but about the 15 minute mark, I thought that we looked pretty comfortable. We looked to be the dominant team. We, we looked like we were going to be the ones that were going to control things. Um, like we said, we thought, I thought the, the pace down the right hand side was a little bit slow the first half, but, um, I thought we worked the ball well. We moved it well. Um, I was really happy with how hard, uh, Buffal was working both offensively and defensively. Um, and, and I think the real, the, the first kind of real big idea that, that comes here is, is, is Van Dyke misses a header. Um, but then after that, um, after that, the, the real big thing is, is Buffal's sliding challenge on Smith. Um, and I'm not sure how you feel about that, what you saw of it, uh, what you made of it. Um, but did you, did you think that was a penalty? Uh, should it have gone Bournemouth's way? From first year in, I thought, oh, it's a pen. Um, watching the replay again, um, and seeing the different angle, uh, I'm going to come out and say it's a dive. I think he sees Buffalo's coming in and he can sort of leaps over him and avoids the contact. And the hope to just make it look like that. Whereas if he just stays on his feet, Buffa is going to bring him down and in the penalty. So it's his own fault. I think the referee got that spot on. I was um, I was actually streaming the game, so I wasn't watching it on Sky Sports. Um, I was watching it on um, NBC, something like that. Okay, yeah. And they were um, they were doing the, the replay of it, and uh, quite a few of their commentary team said the ref got that spot on. And then, um, but it did look like to be a dive. There was one angle where it looked like you could see there was almost no contact with Buffal because he does dive over him. Yeah. But like you said, Buffal has completely blocked off his run um, with that tackle. I mean, I'm not ever going to say to Buffal, yeah, go ahead and do that again, you know, because uh, I don't think that was necessarily a smart challenge. But like you said, if, if, if Smith runs through that, allows the contact to happen and goes down, it's a penalty. Um <laughs> But he he chooses to dive over it, and whether he can argue that you know he was protecting himself or whatever it is, I, I'm not sure. But I think you know uh, we were fortunate in a number of instances there. And then to see him get see Smith get booked on top of that um, was I, I wasn't sure that was necessarily the right move. But I guess if it's right. if you if you're attempting to if you're ever attempting to dive, I guess that's the issue. And then uh, Defoe gets booked as well for for descent. Yeah, it, well, it's a letter of the law, I think. Okay, yeah, if the contact had been there, then that would have been fair enough, but there, were, there wasn't any contact, and he just dived over it, and he, he's trying to simulate the play of a penalty without it actually happening, although, I mean, I, I don't think I'd have been overly angry, well, yeah, I'd have been angry if he'd have given the penalty, <laughs> but I think it'd have been more understandable, but still, I think, that it, 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 once he's made that decision, he has to stick to the letter of the law, and he has to guard him, so in that instance, I reckon the ref did the right thing. Yeah, um, like you said, I'm not, I'm not sure we could have complained too much had the penalty been given against us. And throughout most of the first half, I really thought that we were kind of the team on top. We had to defend a, a, around the 30-minute mark for some time, and then it leads to the goal. And for me, the goal is is extremely disappointing. Um, you kind of think back a few seasons or two seasons. If you have Van Dyke and Font out there, I don't think that decision or that mistake happens. If you have uh, Alderweireld and Font that I don't think that mistake gets made. Um, and we've seen, uh, Hoot do some things the past few weeks where if he gets away with it, if he gets away with that, you just talk about how comfortable he is on the ball. 
Um, but if he loses it, you, you immediately talk about, about the mistake. And I think maybe that's, that's on us to kind of look at that a bit differently, but I thought it was an unnecessary risk to take. And then it just led to, to Bournemouth being able to open the scoring. Um, but what, how did you, uh, when you looked at that whole thing, where, you know, how did you see that? Um, yeah, well, I was, I was very frustrated for me that if he's under that much pressure, he can just clear it down the line. I think. At least that way, then there's no there's no threat towards the goal. I think he tries to be a bit too clever. So coming out of of halftime, obviously we're down one nil. We go down one nil or, or late in the first half. Um, immediately we make a change. Redmond comes on for Ward Prowse, and I think that kind of frees up some. It's a little more pace down the right hand side than as you said earlier. Uh, maybe a little bit more protection for PA. Um, and we spoke about Redmond playing on the right versus the left. Um, it seemed like Bertrand was able to get forward a little bit more without kind of Redmond being in his way almost. Um, and so we kind of saw that a couple of times where Bertrand was able to get down the by to the byline and put in a cross, uh, weren't able to put any of them away, but, um, then coming into the game or coming back when we, when we were able to tie it, um, Ramey won the ball back kind of high up the pitch. Uh, he slipped it out to Redmond who I initially thought was PA during the initial run of it. Um, and then, he puts it across for Austin who does what he does and scores. And I thought from that point, I really thought we could go and win it. I thought that that was going to be what we needed to kind of, to kind of continue to push. But uh, what did you make of the goal? And, and were you, were you kind of satisfied with the, with the finish and, and what, what were you feeling at that point during the match? It's a typical Charlie Austin finish. It was, a, it was lovely, wasn't it? It's, it's a goal you expect Austin to score. Um, I am getting a little bit frustrated though, because, uh, this sort of service isn't that wasn't Gabby Adini was getting, so I kind of feel sorry for him and a little bit frustrated because he's going to receive a little bit of criticism, saying, "Well, Austin scored, you know, three in his last three, and I was like, "Yeah, but when did Gabby have that service? He didn't." So I'm I'm pleased. Don't get me wrong, but you know, whoever sticks the ball in the back of that, I'll be happy. But I think it's a bit hard hard to criticise other players that aren't getting similar type of service. But um, I thought. Once, once we scored, I thought, right, kick on now and win it. And then we never did. So, but Austin did have another good chance in that half where the header that flashed was past the near post, which I think he could have scored. Right. Which is arguably easier than his first time finishing it, level things up. I thought that we had a couple of opportunities to score more goals than we took. And for me, I guess that's a little bit, that's, that's kind of encouraging because we weren't really creating those chances early on, but. And maybe that's not even a fair statement. Maybe we weren't creating clear chances. Um, and uh, they were pointing out that we actually had a higher expected goals, more expected goals than Manchester City did during, during that match. When I think that speaks to the quality of the chances we're starting to create now. Um, and I don't think the quality of the chances we were creating before uh, were necessarily there. But uh, like you said, Austin probably should have scored that, that other, the, the header and, and things like that. But obviously it, it didn't happen. I thought that as the game moved on, we were continuing to apply pressure. And when then Lumina came on, he comes on for Tadich. And we have actually a listener question that we'll squeeze in here. Um, Alex Bauer, who is at AJB88, uh, says, Was the Tadich substitution a good tactical move or signs yet again of a negative approach by Pellegrino? So I'd like to ask you about that. Uh, and then we'll talk about Lumina's performance uh, immediately upon coming into the match. For me, it's a bit of both, to be honest. I think... What we've seen a lot this well, a lot of this season when Lamina originally came in was um Lamina coming in and sitting alongside Romeo and Davis being pushed into the number ten role, which is what we saw happen when Lamina replaced Tadic. For me, Davis really wasn't having a great game. I think, you know, he just it was it was just one of those to forget for him. I think I'd have taken him off for Lamina and left Tadic on. Because I think there was a couple of times where Tadic was linking up play quite well, I think. There was one time where he took the ball brilliantly and then he rouletted past someone, I don't know who it was, and then just laid the ball out to be foul out wide. It's stuff like that that Tadic has. And Davis is normally that has that type of quality, but it just wasn't going his way today. And uh, I think Pellegrino could have been more wiser to take Davis off ahead of Tadic rather than taking Tadic off for the way he was. I think that we are going to struggle to find a way to get both Tadic and Buffal, 
you know, to get all of those players in the midfield together, you know, um, I think the manager desperately wants to play Steven Davis. And I think Steven Davis is, um, I've been harsh on him in the past, but I think he is really, uh, a, a good player and somebody who really, I think in a team where maybe we don't have maybe a standout captain, I think he is the guy. Um, and I think even when you saw him come off later on, um, you know, it, it was only for a few minutes, but Bournemouth created a few more chances and we're kind of pressing forward and whether that's going to happen anyway or not, we don't know. Um, but sometimes I worry uh, about us playing without, without Davis on the, on the field. But I guess you take, a, you take that away and you look at, you look at the Manchester city performance and say he, he wasn't anywhere there and we played just fine. So uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but eventually, like you said, uh, Davis does go off for Gabby Dini, but right when Lamina comes in, um, I was a little frustrated because he came in and he looked a little bit out of place. Um, he got turned immediately, uh, led to a shot that, that Forrester was able to push, uh, out away. Um, and then he gets a yellow om- almost immediately after that. Um, which kind of frustrated me, but I think he, after that, he kind of settled down and kind of got into the game and, and put himself about just fine. Um, the only other thing I can really remember from the game that, that stood out to me, uh, moving towards the end was, was Bertrand's cross for Austin when he went high. Um, and then it really seemed like both teams were really pushing to, to try to win it. Uh, and then eventually Pellegrino makes the decision to take Davis off. Uh, like you said, maybe he wasn't having the best game. Uh, the armband went to Bertrand, which I thought was interesting. And then the, uh, and then Gabby Dini came on and, and I thought that that was a, a chance that maybe we were really going to push, uh, and, and try to win it, but it, it just didn't quite, quite happen. Yeah. It, it was kind of frustrating to see that he waited to the last 10 minutes to bring on Gabby Adini. I mean, what did he have in them 10 minutes? Nothing. He literally had nothing. And, you know, you're going to get people that will say, oh, well, it's another game without a goal, but he literally didn't have a chance. I think I barely saw him touch the ball because we, we, he, honestly, Pellegrino's substitutions, although like sometimes you think, yeah, fair play, you're going for it. The other times you think it's far too late to be making nothing to have that player let have any impact on the game. And it's such a shame because players like Gabby Adini, you know, we all we all know he's got quality. I think we, we all know he can score goals. I think given the right type of service, he could be a twenty goal a season striker. Um but at the minute he doesn't seem to be getting it all the time anymore. I mean he was dropped on his birthday for Austin. You know, luckily Austin scored two two very good headers, but I keep thinking if that was Gabs in that situation, I think he'd have scored the exact same. And uh, well, they're two different types of strikers, I think, because Austin likes to come deep and get in with the play, whereas Gabby Adini will pull out wide to help the play going forward, and then no one will support him. So I don't know. It's tactically Pellegrino needs to sort it out because obviously he's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, it it may be that when when Gabby Adini pulls out wide and kind of runs off the shoulder, he is he kind of distances himself and maybe because the defensive and, and the defense in the midfield are so compact and, and together when we're defending, it means that Gabby Dean is going to be on his own because you're going to have to hold up the play to, to create time for those players to get up with you. Whereas with Austin coming deep, it, it allows other players to kind of come into play sooner. Uh, if that makes sense. And I'm not, I'm not sure that that's correct, but it's kind of maybe, maybe that, that accounts for some of, of some of the difference. Um, we do have another question. Uh, it's from Jeremy Orr, who's at Jeremy Orr. He says, why, oh, why do Saints have to play at such an ungodly hour? And of course, he's on the West Coast with me. So that was a 5.30 a.m. kickoff today against Bournemouth. But um, from your perspective, do fans like, do fans in England like or appreciate the midday kickoff? Or would you rather see the 3 p.m. kickoff uh, that is that is standard? Um, it's difficult. Traditionally in England, it is the, the, three, the 3 o'clock kickoff on the Saturday. You know, I think a lot of fans love that. I think, you know, there's nothing quite like it. I mean, you know, e- evening games get better sort of than earlier games because, you know, you're getting out early. And, um, well, a lot of it is to do with, like, alcohol because a lot of fans, you know, they love to have a drink during, before, during and after the game. Mm-hmm. I think maybe it's something to do with that. That's that's what frustrates fans with midweek games. I know, I know people can drink early and... All this, that, and the other. But do you really want to be drinking at, you know, twelve o'clock in the afternoon compared to, you know, like three, four, four o'clock? In, you know, a little bit later where it's a bit more socially acceptable. And I think that's probably the perspective from the English fans' point of view, especially well, especially the older ones, anyway. Anything else that really stands out about the team that you would like to discuss? It's not really the team. Well, the team, the team should be doing better, but. 
in in all honesty, I'm still not convinced about Pellegrini. So I don't know. He had a lot of positive signs, and then sort of it just fell away. And we've not really that Everton game is the first time we've seen a good performance since West Ham, and we nearly let that fall away. If we are going to go forward, I don't really want to say it, but I don't think Pellegrino would be the man in, in card of our club as much as I'd love him to turn it around. But I think going forward, we're going to need someone, you know, with a better tactical pedigree, you know, someone, yeah, I don't know. I think arguably my first choice then, well, was sacked with me, Marco Silva, someone who had an impact. He plays good football. He's organised defensively and that did help put us on to the next level, but I don't think we're at, at this rate, I don't think we're going to push on. And I still think, you know, we've got a tough run coming up. We've got Chelsea, Arsenal, Tottenham, Leicester, Huddersfield, Man United, all in our next few games. And it, it's it's hard because before Everton, <laughs> it was really hard to see where our next win was going to come from. Whereas now you sort of, you think, OK, go again at Bournemouth, pick up another win. We want to see some consistency. And at the minute, we're not seeing it. And I think... You know, it needs to change, and obviously the man it falls on the manager's head. But the play and the players, the players need to realise that that the players need to um, be committed. Whoever the man in charge is to get the result for the club. At the end of the day, they play for the club, not the manager. Right, right. We have a, we still have a couple of tough matches ahead of us, like you said. Uh, Arsenal, Leicester, then Chelsea, Huddersfield, which you would expect us to. To win, there there are matches in there where you would hope that we would take three points, but this uh, Bournemouth was one of them. You know, if we draw yeah. against Manchester City and win against Bournemouth, the mood is much different than a loss against City and and a, a draw against Bournemouth. Biggest thing this season is we've 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 not had a hard start without any disrespect to the teams that we've played so far, but we've only played City, Liverpool, and Manchester United in fifteen games. For a club of our size, European expectations and ambitions, we could not have 17 points from 50. Not good enough. And I think, you know, the board kind of have to take some sort of blame for that. You know, obviously, we, we've gone to the point where it's not sort of, we're, we're replacing managers now. We're not sort of go, well, we haven't taken a manager from another club since Adkins, but I think it's got to the point where we're just going to take the easy option and probably go for like, a lesser known manager or player that's probably going to cost us like a little bit less so we can keep the club going that way but I think with the new investment coming in we can't we can't afford to be like that anymore all right um so question will you watch match of the day tonight oh, on a Sunday night I probably have nothing better to do I mean I'm not at work till 11 so yeah more than likely because it'll be on a I'm after I'm a celebrity so yeah all right well and then that pretty much does it for me. Um, I don't really have anything else. I think we've kind of covered everything. Thanks for doing this again. And I appreciate your, your time and putting up with the, uh, the dropping of the internet over and over and over. So I appreciate uh, us kind of getting it done. Yeah. That's not your fault. Thank you. Same. Bye. Bye. And that does it for this episode of the Southampton delivery podcast. That was my conversation with Aiden Osman. You can find him on Twitter at Aiden underscore Osman 96. You can get his writing at read Southampton. The links to Aiden's Twitter account and the read Southampton Twitter account, along with the read Southampton Facebook page and website are all in the show notes, along with an article that Aiden wrote uh, a little while ago, looking back at the year since we played uh, Inter Milan and uh, kind of assessing how far we've come or how far back we've fallen. Uh, I'll let you read it and make up your own mind. Uh, but the links to all of those are in the show notes. I think they're all worth checking out. So please consider doing that. And while you are doing that, consider following this show on Twitter and Facebook. On Twitter, we're at SFCDELL underscore IVERY. And at Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash SFCDelivery. There is no underscore in the Facebook address. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider subscribing on iTunes, Stitcher, Acast, Google Play, TuneIn Radio, or wherever else you get your podcasts to be sure that you do not miss future episodes. That way, each episode will be delivered to you as soon as it's available. You won't have to search or wait for it. Also, if you're enjoying the show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes. Each and every time we get a review, it helps other people find out about the show. It helps spread the word, and that is something that we really do appreciate. If you're not okay with doing that or you're not comfortable doing that just yet, consider sharing the show with someone, tag them in a post, retweet the link, do something, show them how to listen to a podcast, show them how to download this one. Uh, I would very much appreciate that. And any feedback that you do have, we'll always take, uh, whether it's audio issues. I know we had some this week, but hopefully 
uh, they weren't too bad or uh, format changes or possible guests, whatever. You can email us at Southampton delivery at gmail.com. You can send us a DM or a Facebook message. Um, both of those are open. So feel free to get in touch with us, whatever way makes you most comfortable. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. So uh, with all of that said, I think that does it for this episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast. And uh, like always, like to thank all of you for listening. Really do appreciate it. Um, really do appreciate the interaction that we get with everybody. And I hope you are all well. And hopefully we have a good result this weekend against Arsenal. Uh, like I said, 4 a.m. kickoff, uh, but we'll be okay. We'll, we'll we'll take care of it here in the United States. I'll be up and ready. Uh, I just hope that you will be too. So um, until next time, remember that together we march on.